question. Have you ever had a problem with sin? There's something about it. It gets a hold of you like a grip, almost like an addiction, and you can't get rid of it. Well, there's a problem with that. You know, sometimes we think to ourselves, oh, nobody needs to know this, and we kind of cover it up. But there's a text. Remember the saying, a little birdie told me? Psalm, I think it's uh, Numbers 32, 23. It says, be sure your sin will find you out. You can't hide because there's something else. Look at, would you take your Bible and find Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. It says, for, can you say it with me? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Who, who is that involving? All of us. We've all sinned. You know why? Thanks to Father Adam, he bequeathed something to us when he sinned. Every child ever born on this planet, with the exception of one, has been a sinner. Who is the exception? Jesus. He has not sinned. He never has, never will. Anyhow, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What is the consequence of that? Anybody think of a text? Hint, still in Romans. Chapter 6 and verse 23. 323, 623. The wages or the consequence of sin is what? Death. In other words, what will sin do to you if you keep it? It'll take your life. But before it actually ends your life, it'll take the quality of life away from you completely. They say what happens in Vegas stays. Well, don't bet on that either, all right? Uh, there's a story in the New Testament. It comes out of all of the synoptics, all three of them, but I'm going to pick out of Luke chapter 5. Now, Chapter 5 has interesting two stories. Number one, a leper. And when lepers came around, they were supposed to call out, unclean, unclean. And people screamed in horror and ran as fast as they could away. He came to Jesus, this is a minister, falling on his face before him. He said, if you will, you can heal me. Just touch me. And Jesus, what did he do? I will. And he grabbed him. He probably got him to see and gave him a great big hug. Did it affect Jesus physically? No. What did it do to the man? Heal them. And Jesus said, now don't tell anybody, you just go show yourself to the priest. Because he knew if the priest heard it, they would be even more opposed to him. These fellows had a problem. They were jealous of their influence with the people. Well, that's the first story. Second one, there's a fella, this happened in Capernaum. All right, that was called Jesus Town. And Peter lived there down in a, in a home, down by the lake, Sea of Galilee. And Jesus came back and he, he's in Peter's house and the word got out. And Jesus couldn't hide. Everybody comes flocking. His disciples are probably sitting in the main room in Peter's house. The, he's sitting there, the disciples around him. And on the other side of the disciples, who's there? The Pharisees and teachers of the law from all over the whole country, they're there. And there's no room for anybody else. How come? Well, they're all outside, shushing each other up. Shh, they wanted to hear what was coming out from inside the house. The, these fellows had kind of blocked everybody else so they couldn't get in. They didn't want them hearing what Jesus had to say. They weren't there to hear what Jesus had to say. They were there to get him in something so they could go back and get him put to death. Get rid of him. They hated him. Well, not all of them. Remember the fellow Jairus, his name was? His little girl got very sick. And where did he go finally? 
to Jesus. And while Jesus is dealing with a woman that touched the hem of his garment, here comes a, a servant from Jairus' home. He says, Master, leave the master. Your daughter just passed. And Jesus immediately turned to him. He says, don't worry. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Let's go. And he got there. And what did he do with her? After he got the, the criers out of the house, he went in there and he said, Talitha kum, which means what? Little girl, get up. And what happened? She got up. Now, if Jesus had the power to raise the dead, why did the Jews think they could kill him? It never made sense to me, and it still doesn't. Anyhow, this fellow lives in Capernaum. Everybody in town knew him because they would all given him alms at different times. And he... Uh, he had been living a pretty wild life, and it began to get to him. And his body began to break down. Sin will take away from you everything you've got that's positive and replace it with what is bad and not desirable. Anyway, so he went to the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and he said, I need help. I need somebody to forgive me. The guilt is eating my soul out. They looked at each other. They looked at him and said, Buddy, you're under the curse of God. Go home and die. Get out of here. It wasn't long. He couldn't even walk. He could hardly move. And then the word came. Jesus is here. He's at Peter's house down by the lake. And he said, he'd heard that Jesus had a way of accepting and forgiving sinners like him. If it wasn't for that, he would never think of coming into his presence because Jesus was a holy man. Oh, what to do? He uh, thinks and thinks we're going to, and then he got an idea. I know. And he called one of his children over. He says, go get so-and-so and so-and-so and and have them get so-and-so and so-and-so. And And pretty soon here come these four men. And he says, fellas, You've got to get me to Jesus. I'm going to die if I don't. I don't want to die. I want to live. Get me to Jesus. And they looked at each other and said, well, sure. And they went and got a stretcher or something like that, a pallet. They laid him on it, hooked down to the corners, ready, forward, ho, and off they go. And as they approach Peter's house, the I mean, there's a mob of people. The whole yard is full of people. And they looked at each other as they go, and they said, you think we can get in there? Well, I don't know, but let's try. Two, three, four times they tried to get in. They couldn't. The mob was too dense. And they backed away, and they put that thing down on the ground, and they looked at him, and then they looked at the mob, and they looked at each other. They didn't know what to do. And finally, our friend our hero, he says, fellas, I got an idea. Why don't we go up on the roof and you can take the roof up and let me down that way and I get to Jesus that way. What do you say? Brilliant idea. Let's do it. Up on the roof they went. Now, before we take it any farther, I need to tell you how they built houses. They put up the walls. They put poles across on the top of of the walls. Then they brought brush. And the more branches in the brush here, the brush, the better. And they put it down on all those poles. And then they brought in maybe clay. Have you ever worked with clay? It's pretty gooey when it's wet. But when it gets dry, it's hard as a rock. Well, anyhow, they had, they put dirt on top, clay or whatever, on top of the brushes. And then they packed it, rolled it out smooth. And when it dried, it was a perfect roof. So these fellows, they start tearing up the dirt. The outside of the, we call it shingles, but they weren't shingles. Anyhow, they start getting it out of the way and they start pulling up the brush. And what's happening down below? What are these Pharisees and teachers of the law doing? They're backing up. Why? Because, well, we can the priest and the Levite saw that poor fellow beaten, half dead, lying there bloody. What did they do with him? Avoided him because they didn't want to get 
defiled. And, then, and so they back up. And would you believe there's lots of room in the middle of that room where Jesus was? Lots of room. And then here he starts coming down, little by little, hand over hand. They're letting him down. And Jesus looks up into the eyes of those four men. You know, it says in the Bible several times, nobody had to tell Jesus. He knew what was in people. And he knew what was in these fellows. Just looking into their eyes, they loved this guy they were letting down. He was dear to them. So here he comes. Well, in the meantime, these Pharisees and doctors of the law, they were the people that this man had come to and they had condemned him to the curse of God. And they said, oh boy, what's going to happen now? And they set that thing down in front of Jesus and then Jesus looks down at him. Did he say anything? Not a word. Not a word. Now, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we, what? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to do two things. What are they? To what? Forgive us our sins. And what's the other thing? To cleanse us from how much? All unrighteousness. I don't know the state of your soul as you sit here today or, or view us by a media. But you may be somebody like that poor man was, loaded with guilt, sin with a grip on you. You can't get rid of it. What does 1 John 1, 9 say? Let's, let's go back a minute to verse 8 and verse 10. Verse 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we're lying. What's that? And then verse 10 says, if we say we have not sinned, is there any difference between sin and sinning? Sin is the nature we were born with that rebels against God. I think I made that moment up, that point a couple of minutes ago. It rebels, we, leads us to rebel against God. And it produces all kinds of wrong things and avoiding right things. Now, just between those two texts, the nature produces the acts. That's the real problem with, with sin. Verse 9 says, if we, what? If we confess our sins, he will forgive and cleanse. Did he confess? Not a word. He never said a word. He just looked into Jesus with the hungriest eyes you ever could see. I've got a dog and a cat, pets at home, and you ought to see the way they look at me sometimes, enough to tear your heart out. <laughs> I know you want me to play with you, but I don't have time right now. I gotta go to church. Well, anyhow. He doesn't say a word, he just looks with a longing soul. He is so he's not long for this world. He has no hope anywhere except with the one he's looking up at. And Jesus looks down with a big smile. Son, how'd you like Jesus to call you son or daughter? That would mean you're very special to him. Wouldn't it? Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. And what happened then? Oh, he collapsed back onto that stretcher. Oh, what happened to his pain? Gone. What happened to his anguish? Gone. What happened to his, his guilt? Vaporized. He was a new person. The greatest healing is not from leprosy, but the leprosy of sin. That's the greatest healing any of us could ever have, is to hear Jesus say to us, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. Anybody here need to hear Jesus say that to you today? Yes, yes. Well, he said it to that man, and it's recorded in the scripture, so we can read it and I'd apply it to us. He said it to you. Amen? we got a wonderful Savior, folks. We really do. 
And, uh, well, in the meantime, what are these Pharisees, the potentates, what are they doing? They're, they're looking into each other's eyes. Ha, ha, we got it, we got it. They weren't there to experience healing like Jairus came and received for his daughter. They weren't there for that. They weren't there to watch Jesus, to hear all the things he had to say. They were there to get it. We got it. That's blasphemy. Nobody can forgive sins except God himself. But they didn't say it, but they said it with their eyes. And Jesus looked around at them. He knew what they were thinking. He said, fellas, why are you thinking what you're thinking? What do you think it's easier to do? Tell this fella that his sins are forgiven or tell him to get up and walk? Now, that's a question we ought to take a minute and answer for just a minute here, okay? What is easier, to heal somebody and tell them they can get up and walk or tell them their sins are forgiven? Now, in one of those synoptics, it says the power of the Lord to heal was present with Jesus. He could have tell, told all those potent days, your sins are forgiven too. But they weren't looking for forgiveness. Well, they, <laughs> he looks at them. He says, why are you thinking what you're thinking? What is easier? What was easier, church? What was easier? Well, as far as healing him and getting him up on his feet, that was pretty simple. The spirit was there. I could do that for him. I ran across a comment from Ellen White where she said it was the angels that did the miracles for Jesus. I mean, that's pretty simple. Just get a good connection and my wonderful things can happen, right? Well, but what does it take to forgive? You know, in the upper room, what did Jesus do? He washed everybody's feet. Why weren't his feet washed? He had no sins. He needed no cleansing. He was clean to begin with. Amen? What a wonderful, perfect Savior, holy, a man of God, God himself, really. But to forgive, what did Jesus have to experience? He had to die on the cross. That's the most anguished thing could have ever happened to him. That was so much harder. But then in answering his question, he said, so you may know the Son of Man has full authority on planet Earth to forgive sins. What do you say next? Smiled out at our hero who is now in bliss. He said, son, get up, roll up your mat, take it home, and hello to your family. And this fellow bounces up like a ping pong ball released from a, or a tennis ball from those cans. And he grabs that thing and he starts out. It never says he said anything to Jesus. But he did something else on the way out and it set the whole crowd going. He was praising the Lord as he left. Praise God, I'm healed. Praise God, I'm forgiven. You want to do that with me? Praise God, I'm healed. Praise God, I'm forgiven. Maybe we ought to do it the other way. Praise God, I'm forgiven. Praise God, I'm healed. And out he goes and the people start singing praise with him. Wow, incredible. And when he got home, what happened? Use a little imagination. There was rejoicing in that family. They never thought would ever happen. But it was happening right in front of me. Dear kids, I'm home. I'm healed. I'm well. I'm forgiven. I've been to Jesus. Don't wait. If you've never gone, now is the time to go to Jesus. Now is the time. We have a table here, which we have a tray on it. 
In this are two things. One, a little bowl of pieces of bread. You know what they represent? Jesus' broken body. You know, he was flogged twice. And it's a wonder he could even move after that. But anyway, that's what that represents. And when you take one of those, the deacons are going to be passing them when we come back. When you take one of those, you're saying, Jesus, I'm accepting what you did for me. Amen. All right. There's also little cups filled with unfermented wine, grape juice. What do they represent? They represent the shed blood of Jesus. He did it for you, for me, for all of us. Amen? What, what a gift. In Psalm 116, it's, What shall I render to the Lord for all his goodness to me? It says, I will lift up the cup of salvation. This is saying, Lord, I'm accepting your gift, your death for me that I might be saved. Now, Jesus, before he did that, something went on in that upper room. These fellows are sitting there. By the way, where had they been walking all day? Out there where the animals walked. And if you're going to walk where animals walk, what do you need before you go inside the house? You need to get your feet washed. That's right. Nobody had been there. No, that's what servants did. But they're not a servant. Oh, no, I'm not going to do that. And so they're lying around Jesus. And he, of course, he can smell it. <laughs> you know, the stuff on their feet. He gets up. And he goes over to a, probably a little table. Takes off his outer garment. And what did he do? He got a basin of water and a towel. Maybe he even got soap. You think he got soap? Anyhow, he, he came back to the disciples and he started one after another washing them. I remember in Romania when we had communion one, one Sabbath, they let the Adventists from America use the water first because we were honored guests. And then after we had done it, then they, three couples per basin, and they would go get some more. They were very frugal with their warm water. Anyway, then you know the story. Peter, uh, Judas, and all the others. Peter didn't want Jesus to wash him. And he said, if I don't, you have no part with me. And after he'd washed them, he came back, put his outer garment on, and he said, you know, I've given you an example that you do what I have done. As we let somebody wash our feet, we're going to do this here in just a couple of minutes. As we let somebody wash our feet, we're saying, I accept forgiveness. And as we bow down, kneel down, and wash somebody's feet, you know what else we're saying? We're saying, I am a forgiver. I forgive you. Maybe you didn't need to forget them, but that, that's the symbolism of being a forgiver like Jesus. Let's pray, shall we? Father in heaven, what would we be? What would we do if it weren't for Jesus and you, the one who gave him to us? He washed their feet and he said, it's an example we should do, so we want to do the same thing. Wash somebody's feet like you did, Jesus. So, bless us as we go to do this. In your name, Savior, we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Shane Anderson, lead pastor at Pioneer Memorial Church. It's no newsflash to say that social media has become an integral part of our daily lives. And here at Pioneer, we want to use it to enrich our lives. I invite you to connect with us online by visiting the links that are shown on the screen we are constantly sharing inspiring content that we believe can make a real and positive difference in your life. So if you haven't already, I encourage you to follow and subscribe to our social media platforms. Not only will you stay up to date with our latest news and events, 
but you will also be able to engage with an online community that shares a common belief, experience, and care for your well-being. And by sharing our content, you can help us reach even more people with our message of hope and love in Jesus. Join us by creating a positive impact online and making a difference in the world. Thank you, and we look forward to connecting with you online.